All right, let's get started this morning as we press on in our study of sanctification. You can change. Maybe you're excited about some progress in the past week. Perhaps there were enough bumps in the road to remind you that our study is worth the while. Uh, this morning, uh, we want to dive into one of my... Hey, uh, Daniel, can you grab the doors back there? Or Roy, that'll work. Thanks, guys. And maybe give a mean look to the people in the lobby, too. <laughs> this chapter really gets into uh, some helpful ideas. The rubber kind of meets the road, and if we're looking for that real practical help, then these thoughts hopefully will start moving us from the ideas to the actual implementation. Uh, the title of the chapter is, What Truths Do You Need to Turn To? In other words, what truth do you need in the moment of temptation to help you choose the right path? Uh, or, if you've been struggling with sin, that besetting sin, Hebrews says it kind of simply, lay aside the sin and the weight that so easily besets you. Okay, we get the picture there of a runner laying aside extra weight to run, but that laying aside has other biblical words that we could use to describe it. Uh, and I think this morning will help us do that in the language of being done with the lies of the devil and instead clinging to the truth. We need truth in order to change. If you don't have the power of God's truth to change you, what do you have? From our own experience, we were probably left with a pretty small toolbox. It's things like my resolve, uh, my guilt, um, my pride because I want to look good to others. And as we've studied before, none of those things have power to bring about heart change. Uh, the truth is what we need to set us free from uh, the bondage of addictive, enslaving sin, besetting sin. And so truth is what we need in order to change. Uh, think about it. If, if you were talking to a friend who was kind of a worry wart, uh, always stewing about stuff, always worried about what's going to happen, uh, always talking out loud about, well, what if this, what if that? Well, the truth that's going to help them change is truth about God and who he is and how he operates a universe. The fact that God is in control is the truth they need to turn to when they're always anxious about where the, the money's going to come from and how are the kids going to do at college and what's going to happen if this or that. All right, all those things may be valid questions to ask and wisdom may look down the road and make wise decisions accordingly, but there's only so much you can do and eventually you're going to have to resign yourself to the necessity of faith in what God has said. We need truth in order to change. Jesus said it this way in John 17, in his prayer to the Father uh, on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane. He said, sanctify them by your truth. Your wor word is truth. So when we say we need truth in order to change, we're really just paraphrasing Jesus, who in his prayer to the Father prayed, that the disciples would be sanctified by truth. They would be set apart. They would be changed more and more to become like Christ, and that would happen because they had God's truth. You remember in that prayer, Jesus isn't asking that the Father would take the disciples out of this messy, sinful world. Rather, he was acknowledging that he was sending them into that world. That's our study in the book of Acts. He's sending them into the world to be light amongst all the darkness, knowing that as they go into the world, they're going to be constantly contaminated by uh, the world's thinking and, and ideas and habits, and, and they're going to be drawn to those things 
but their hope of being clean, or in our case, changing to be clean, uh, lies in the sanctifying power of God's truth. Paul would echo this in Romans 12 when he tells them to be, or to stop being conformed to the world, but to be transformed, to be changed by the renewing of the mind. That, that's a phrase that rests solidly on truth. And so we change because of truth. Therein is the power to change. Every time we face temptation, uh, James would give us this foundation in chapter 1. We, we are basically being asked to entertain a lie of the devil, and then the great hope in that moment is that we would meet that lie with the truth of God's word. You know, even in James 1 there, when we read about being drawn away of our own lust and enticed, also in James 1, we've been told that every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from the Father above. And there's, there's more thought there that reminds us that all the good giving of God, it's not just, you know, food and house and clothing. It begins with the giving of his son so that we could be like him. But having, having that as a foundation that every good gift comes from God, every perfect gift, everything we need comes from this benevolent father. Then hear him say, beware lest you be drawn away of your own lust and enticed. But that's not an isolation. The fact is we've been told God is good and you're going to be tempted to think he's not and to believe the lie of the devil that there's some good that has been withheld that you should pursue on your own. And it's interesting that James 1 is really just giving us the theological language of a narrative story all the way back in Genesis 3. Because there, Adam and Eve are in the garden in the presence of a good God who's given them a bounty of things to enjoy. There is but one rule expressing God's authority not to eat of this one tree. And the devil comes, and, and in just a matter of seconds, you can read the text for yourself and, and time how long it took the devil to convince Adam and Eve that maybe God wasn't as good as they thought and there might be other good things to explore. Behind every sin or every temptation is a lie. We learn that from Genesis 3. The serpent persuades Adam and Eve to doubt the goodness of God and now all that persuasion is in the very DNA of the devil. Uh, Jesus in John chapter 8 would, would be speaking to the Pharisees and he'd tell them, you're of your father, the devil. Uh, and he describes him as a murderer and a liar. Um, by his lies, he brings about ruin and destruction. Read the Proverbs and you just see there's these two paths. Path of the wise that leads to blessing in life and the path of the fool that leads to ruin. Um, and oftentimes we stand at the fork in the road and we think we know best. And Proverbs again and again says there's a way that seems right to a man, but it ends in ruin and death. Why? Because this is what the devil does. He lies to get people on the path to ruin. And that ruin is a charge laid at his feet. He's a murderer. He's, he's a ruiner. He's a destroyer. And he does everything he can to get us to that path of destruction. In a sense, it's self-destruction. And yet, uh, it's a self-destruction that was embarked upon because we were deceived by these lies of the devil. Paul, writing to Timothy, describes the unbelievers that you will encounter this week, that you're supposed to be gracious toward, that you're supposed to be gospel light for, but he says they've been taken captive by the will of the devil. By his deceit, he's, he's kind of brought them into the fold. And they think, like Moses was tempted to think, that there's pleasure in sin and it's going to last, but it doesn't. The devil's a liar. And that 
pleasure of sin turns to pain and ruin. Again, reading through the Proverbs this last month, just seeing uh, even, even the, the foolish young man of Proverbs 6 who goes into the adulterous woman and everything looks so good and all the sights and sounds and smells, everything seems so pleasurable. And yet the text says he doesn't know going there that there's, there's basically death there. There are skeletons uh, in the closet. It, it just, it's a place of ruin. But the devil didn't advertise that. He just had his lies that he presented. This master marketer, always telling lies uh, because he's a liar and he's a murderer. Behind every sin is a lie. And you sin when your heart trusts or believes what was said in that lie. And then you treasure whatever that lie was offering, you thought that looks valuable. It's just like watching TV. You're watching the Chiefs game and the commercials come on and they, they, they say something about a product and you might believe it and then think, man, that's a great deal. In other words, there's value in that. That price for that product, I want that. We sin when we trust the lie is true and then we treasure it as that's something worth having. And, and this is the process uh, for James 1, being drawn away and enticed and then indulging in and suffering the consequence of sin. We believe the lie. We trust it. We treasure it instead of trusting and treasuring God's truth. Interesting, in Romans chapter 1, the men studied through this in our forum a few months back. The language there of unbelievers is they are those who exchanged the truth for a lie. They, the truth was there for them to see, and they said, but that what is he saying? What is the devil? The lie looked so good. They said, here, you have the truth. We'll take the lie. They exchanged the truth of God for the lie. The truth of God. Well, if we go back to Genesis 3 or here James 1, the truth of God is that he is good and gives all that we need. And the lie is he's not good. I should trust the devil because he's telling me a better way to get what I want. You see, the problem with our inability to change, when we say we're struggling in a certain sin, we can identify a problem based on this thought of believing a lie or believing the truth. So if we're finding ourselves unable to change or change seems difficult, there, there may be a gap between what we believe in theory, kind of a confessional faith about God and his word, and what we believe in practice, kind of a functional faith. Oh, our confession of faith may be good. We, we're not going to say God's not good. We're not going to document that in some kind of systemized theology. In theory, in confession, our faith is, is right. In practice, where the rubber meets the road, when you feel like your spouse is manipulating you or taking advantage, when you feel like your, your parents are inconsistent or unfair, when you feel like your circumstances are too hard, we believe lies in that moment instead of believing what God has said for us in that moment. So we can sing on Sunday morning in Christ alone, proclaiming our justification by faith in Christ. But by Monday morning, we feel the need to prove ourselves to God. We have to be this right kind of person and, and we just launch into another week of kind of performance mode. We can sing, rejoice, the Lord is king. 
But in actuality, we don't rejoice. We worry every time the news is telling us who's going to run for president and we go into a whirlwind of stewing about what's going to happen and how's that going to affect the economy and what if that means this and that. And we, we just spiral out of control, at least out of control in the sense of spending all our time on things we really can't control instead of believing what our confession of faith would say, that God is in absolute control and we can trust him. So maybe sanctification is this process of narrowing the gap between what we really believe, we, we say we believe this in theory or in confession, but somehow that needs to work down into our daily practice. In John chapter 8, we mentioned this in a sermon a couple of weeks ago. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. That theme verse from the Unshackled radio program we talked about. There is, there is freedom in the truth. Uh, so if we're trying to change, and in that change process, there, it feels like sin has its hooks into us. We're trying to change. We're trying to lay aside that sin. It means we need to see through the lie and believe the truth, and that truth will be freeing. It will show us the path. And so God's word in the Psalms is described as a light for our path. The next step isn't one of darkness or uncertainty. Now, you might not have the steps into August, September, November, 2024, and beyond, but you'll have the step for right now, the step of obedience, the step of faith. You're, you trust God today. His word lights our path. There's not uncertainty there. there. There is freedom to take that step. Beyond that, Psalm 119.9 says, How can a young man keep his way pure? And we could probably ask the similar question, how, how can any of us change to be more like Christ? By guarding his way, by guarding it according to your word. So how do, how do we clean up our lives? Not for salvation, not to merit something, but as a pilgrim on this journey, how do we keep our way clean? We do that by abiding in, believing in God's truth. The author then uh, seeks to put this into practice by giving us four truths to turn to. Um, and, and it's more than just, again, the systemized theology of saying, okay, this I know is true, this I know is true, but rather in the moment where the Proverbs freezes the scenario of two people in conflict and the Proverbs say a soft answer turns away wrath. Well, in that moment, you need to be thinking, why, why would I respond in anger? What lie was I believing? in that moment that would make me indulge in the conflict rather than some kind of yielding here, the soft answer. You see, we have all these scriptures in our minds like that one, a soft answer turns away wrath, but how do you pick up that tool and use it this week? So that this week is argument-free, conflict-free as much as it lies in you, Romans 12 would say. You see, somehow in that moment, the opportunity for sin is there, but if our study is accurate, that means something about that opportunity to sin appealed to me. I wanted something out of that moment. Maybe I just want to be right, and my pride isn't going to back down because, I, you know, you've said this probably, I know I'm right, like, Usually the other person thinks that too. So what do you do there? You can escalate this or you can think, wait a minute. Am I believing this lie that I have to be right? That I have to be seen as smart or uh, a good memory or able to diagnose a situation? Or can I, can I let this go? 
is there, is there any great implication here that demands I stand up for some kind of righteous cause, or is my only cause me? What if, what if the person I'm arguing with is wrong, and I was right in thinking I was right? There are times when we have to ask, does that really matter? Does my being right, does proving it in this moment is that the most pleasing thing to the Lord that I could do right now? But there's some kind of lie there that we're tempted to believe. There's something we want. We treasured something out of that scenario that made us dive into it, and now the argument is escalated. So these truths that the author is giving us, they're, they're not just, one, they're not the only truths you can cling to. He's, he's just giving examples of how you could offset the draw to think wrongly or act wrongly with the draw of Scripture to steer us rightly, to anchor us rightly. Charles Hodge, this goes all the way back to Civil War days when he was kind of steering Princeton Seminary, said this, the true knowledge of Christ is not the apprehension of what he is simply by the intellect, but it also involves the corresponding feeling of adoration, delight, desire, and contentment. So as, as we're about to just hear examples of truth to cling to, Instead of believing the lie, realize it's not just facts. It's not just memorize and recite this passage. No, it's more than that. It's in that passage of God's truth, see the character of God. And not just know that this is what God is, but rather worship God in that moment. Delight in him, as the Psalms say. Desire him and his ways and be content in him. So when he says, this is the way of purity, I see God as good to give that boundary. His, his commands aren't grievous, but I'm also content in that boundary. Because adultery, premarital sex, sex pornography, it all betrays a lack of contentment in God and what he's given and in his boundaries that he's applied to marriage. So as you counsel others, counsel your own heart, counsel your kids, I think Hodge is, is giving us a kind of a well-rounded view of what true biblical obedience is. It's not just knowing some fact and kind of begrudgingly doing it. It's recognizing God is good. His rules, his precepts, his boundaries are good. Not just good in and of themselves, which they are, but good for me. Read Deuteronomy 6 and how that ends. These laws are for our good always. These are the thoughts that need to be in our minds. Psalm 34, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Psalm 37, delight yourself also in the Lord. I think Hodge was right. Intellect is certainly part of grasping truth and making decisions based on it. But with that intellect, to add the old Puritan word, would be the affections, the delight, the desire, the adoration and worship, the contentment. So what do we need to preach to our own hearts? Martin Lord Jones would reference that often. He said at one point, have you noticed that the most that most of your unhappiness in life is due to the fact that you are listening to yourself instead of talking to yourself. Now, when you think that through, you realize it's kind of nonsensical, but it also kind of makes sense. Uh, we tend to stew when we're just listening to ourselves and we're rehearsing the stuff that just hasn't, you know, been what we thought it would be in that given day, that moment or that meeting at the office, uh, what you thought your kids were going to love and enjoy and respond to with such gratitude that you would be the best parent ever, and, 
and they complained about all of it, and, and suddenly you're not feeling quite right. You're, you're listening to yourself rehearse all the bad stuff instead of talking to yourself with truth, preaching to yourself, counseling yourself, uh, reminding yourself, don't believe the lies that everything's bad. Don't believe the lies that my kids will never change. This is the way it always is. Don't believe these even little daily lies. Instead, confront them with truth. Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, said, bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. You know, this chapter, if nothing else, is telling us the war is raging in your mind this coming week. That will be the battlefield. Truth versus lie, and it will be expressed in our attitudes and behavior. That's how we'll see which path you chose. But the real battle was back in the mind when those thoughts were brewing and we either had to take that thought captive to the obedience of Christ, or let it run wild. I saw this picture on one of the news kind of feeds I looked at this week, and it was this record-breaking python that they pulled out of the Everglades down there in Florida. Uh, apparently, the Everglades are being overrun by large snakes, all right? Um, and there are these guys who, for not nearly enough money, just start wandering out into the swamp trying to find snakes, they go out at night and drive along the roads and look for the shine of the moonlight off the skin of these snakes, and they'll find, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 foot snakes. Um, you know, great big, you know, one foot thick snakes, and they'll just jump on them and grab them and go after it. And we're not talking with like robotic tools or anything. Just like a guy and his buddy. Hey, you want to go catch a snake? And they go out there and they catch snakes. So I'm looking at this record snake. It was like hanging on the ground, drooped over one guy's neck, hanging on the ground, drooped over the other guy's neck, hanging on the ground. And they're like carrying the snake to the park ranger to get it weighed and measured and get their money. Well, <laughs> that's insane, for one. <laughs> um, <laughs> but... They were going to grab that snake, bring it captive, and be done. Get their money out of it. You might say, I would never grab a snake and, and tackle something like that. And at times, I think we're saying in our Christian lives, well, I, I, I could never tackle that. I've struggled with this all my life. Or for years, I've struggled with this. I, I could never get victory over that. Well, you might never catch a python in the Everglades, but it's not really an option of whether or not you should overcome sin. That's a given. Uh, the victory Christ has won for us at the cross is the victory we are to continue to announce by rejecting the lie of the devil and believing God's truth. We need to preach God's truth to our hearts, bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Who is Christ? What has he done? What has he said? What is his calling on my life? So does this thought of lashing out in anger, because maybe that'll work with my kids, is that thought in obedience to Christ, who is God's plan to nurture and admonish us. Well, if that's what I'm to do as a parent, then the lie I'm tempted to believe is fix it quick because that'll bring me some peace of mind. So just kind of rage a little and kids will be scared and back down and they'll comply. It can work. It's a great tool in the immediate short term. And then it actually betrays itself and becomes a provocation to the children rather than I should have taken that thought captive. That's not how God said to raise children. Bring that thought captive, grab that snake, stuff it in the bag and turn it in for money. Like figure out the real value and the real value is what God has said. 
A couple examples that the author gives then for truths about God that help us reject the lie. And again, the, these are just his examples. You could be reading your Bible on any given day and, and just jot down a sentence of truth, a couple of words. Um, because the idea here is God's word is, is this truth that we need. And sometimes it's, it's okay to go looking for a truth to meet a need. But I would just tell you, a lot of times you don't, you don't even need to find that exact right verse for the need. You just you get into God's word and you will be amazed at what an Old Testament story might teach you about your struggle. And you're not a king with multiple wives and armies attacking from various directions or whatever you'd read in Kings and Chronicles. But in the reading of that, you're going to see the human heart and the need and the struggle and God's answer. So get into the word. Use these truths. Find your own. Um, but get good at articulating concise truth that you need for that day. Number one, he says, God is great. So we don't have to be in control. God is great. Now, that's a vague word, but this is, this is kind of the, the author's you know, license here to use kind of colloquial word instead of saying, you know, God is sovereign or articulating God's providence or his omnipotence. He's kind of simplifying this for us. And, and all those thoughts may be in your head, but it's pretty easy to remember God is great, so I don't have to be. God's in control. I don't have to be. You start feeling as a parent, if you, if you really analyze what's going on in your house, that you're, you, you're not in control. Oh, you may be in the boundaries and the regulations, the authority, and that's a good thing. But as far as getting into the heart of that child and making that heart work the way you want it to, you can't do that. And so faith in parenting means I have to believe God's truth, that I can't control that heart, but I can fill that head with the truth of God's word that's what admonition is, remember, to put into the mind. That's what the Greek word means. Put it in their head. Tell them again and again, this is who God is. This is what God said. And probably add the icing on the cake. And this is why, this is why we delight in him. He's been so good to us. God is great, so we don't have to be in control. Bring the greatness of God into your conversations about citizenship and politics those are good conversations to have. That's where God's put us. We have responsibilities and duties. Just exercise them in a way that doesn't betray faith, that doesn't, that doesn't spring out of fear. We can be very proactive. God's king over everything, but he's kind of told us to exercise dominion here. And as much as our citizenship allows, that to, allows us to do that, let's, let's engage but act from the foundation of who God is. Psalm 115.3, our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. God is great, so we don't have to be in control. Number two, God is glorious, so we don't have to fear others. We don't need to crave approval. We don't need to fear rejection. We don't need to be a somebody to be accepted. We've studied through this and motivations for change. We're not trying to change so that we'll be accepted by God. We already are accepted by God, so we're acting on that standing that we have with him. Proverbs 29, 25, the fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. Reject the lie that you have to measure up to everyone else, that you have to please them, that you can please them. The fear of man lays a snare. There's going to be a lie in believing that somehow the ultimate standard is to look around and figure out what everyone else is doing, and that's what I have to do. There's a snare in that, but there is freedom, there is help, there is change 
for the one who trusts in the Lord. There's safety there. God is enough. And knowing where I stand with him should have an effect on how I think about my standing with others. Doesn't mean I disregard them. I shouldn't say, I don't care what my wife thinks. All that matters is how I stand before God. Well, no, the reality is, if I know rightly how I stand before God in Christ, then Ephesians 5 makes perfect sense that I'm supposed to love my wife as Christ loved me as the church. So it, it all flows together. Once I, once I can see God as great and now see him as glorious, he's enough, then now I'm not living and dying by what everyone else thinks of me. As a parent, we face this, you know, we're not really that bothered if our kid's a brat at home when we ask him to do something. It might bother us a little bit, but we get kind of lazy. Then you get to church and your kid's a brat in front of everyone else. And you're like, what in the world? They're, they're never like this at home. Well, we just kind of got used to it at home. Um, but our pride kind of rose up within us when we were at church. We care about what others think. A lot of talk is made of self-esteem, and sometimes, sometimes it can be rightly defined or described, but generally it compounds the problem. We become dependent on whatever or whoever is building that self-esteem. We need more of that. And instead of addressing the heart and its failure and the sufficiency of Christ, we lean on whatever it was that built the esteem or whoever it was. We become dependent on those things. And even, even those things or those people then can be the devil's deceit. We, we lean hard on our spouse or we, we boast on, I'm, I'm a family man and, and it's all about family. That's my identity. And that's a lie of the devil that you'll find your identity, your, your satisfaction in, in those things that are even God-given things. Our identity and our satisfaction are in Christ. And again, when we understand that, all those other spheres are benefited. So it's not to their neglect that we put Christ first. It's, it's to their advantage. It's to their benefit if we put Christ first. God is glorious. We don't have to fear others. Think of Elisha and his servant in 2 Kings 6. The servant could only look around and see this doesn't look good. And, and Elisha prayed and asked God to open his eyes to see the angelic army that was around even the enemy army. To get the right perspective. God is glorious. And in him we rest. There's nothing else that can harm us. David would say the same in Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom will I be afraid? I'm, I'm okay. I'm good with him. He's glorious. Nothing else holds a light to that. Number three, God is good, so we don't have to look elsewhere. We could make the argument for this point from John 4. We've already talked about it from Genesis 3. Go to John 4 and the Samaritan woman. Not just one husband, but another try and another try and another try and another try. Clearly a thirsty soul, not satisfied. But she's invited to taste the satisfaction of a good God. God is good, so we don't have to look elsewhere. And change comes when we stop believing that sin will satisfy, that the good pleasure of sin will last. It won't. It's, it's only for a season. And instead, we turn to a lasting and pure goodness, which is from God. Isaiah is so picturesque as he gives God's truth about basically drinking out of a pothole. 
a broken cistern. You know, you can picture like an old broken down fountain that doesn't have the running water anymore stirring it up. So now the green algae is taking over, kind of slime film kind of growing on the surface off to the sides. You know, even if you scoop right out of the middle, hold it up to the light, it's going to have a murky kind of color. And, and Isaiah is saying, why are you drinking water out of that cistern instead of out of the, this fountain of pure water, this spring? We need to believe that God is good and we don't have to look elsewhere. It's interesting in Psalm 119, it's also interesting, another interesting, I've got a lot of interestings. <laughs> to me, you're sitting there saying, stop saying it's interesting. Let us be the judge, right? Um, Psalm 119 on my Bible reading plan was listed as just one chapter among the others, you know, and I just thought, that, that's not fair. That needs to be broken up a little bit. Uh, that, that day's reading didn't happen in one day. Um, but in reading Psalm 119, it's amazing how often we're told the law, the statutes, the precepts, all those other words that are used for God's word are good and they're a delight and they're beneficial and they're helpful over and over again we're told this is good that God has revealed this this is good God has pointed you down the right path this is good that God cares enough to make sure you know how to please him but the lie of the devil is rules are bad rules are bad it's legalism it's it's just stark obedience it's it's a burden and that's just not true. Reject that lie. Look, look at that garden scene again and realize they believed the devil when he said God's not being good and just keep reading to see how it ends. Before God ever even says anything to them, they feel the guilt and shame and they hide themselves. The devil didn't tell them that was going to happen. Keep reading, and, and you see them driven from the garden. And the angel with the sword to keep them out of the garden, reminding them, you can't get back to holiness and fellowship. It's over. The devil didn't tell them that they were going to forfeit everything they enjoyed. They thought they were adding just a little bit more. And it was complete loss. Keep reading. Cain kills his brother. And mom and dad have to dig a hole and bury their son. The devil didn't tell them about that. We should be smarter because we're reading these scriptures and we're seeing from Genesis, Genesis all the way through that sin doesn't pay. It doesn't work. It doesn't deliver. It's not true those temptations. Believe instead that God is good, that his boundaries are good, and that he is enough. And finally, number four, God is gracious, so we don't have to prove ourselves. Luke 15 teaches us of God's grace. In that story, the prodigal son there's this father waiting, and he sees the son, and he runs, and he embraces, he forgives, he restores. But this grace is lost on the son. His thought was, just make me a servant. I'm not good enough to be a son. Well, that makes no sense to the father because he is a son, a restored son. And in the story, the older brother can't accept the graciousness of the father. That older brother is marked by this restless anger. The text says he was, he was angry and he wouldn't go into the feast. Just standing out there on the porch, stewing. And you want to go up to him and ask him, what, what do you want? Would you rather your brother didn't come home? Would that be an option? Are you okay if he comes home, but you're given the right to kind of lord over him his failure? There's a restless anger in that older brother because he, he cannot believe the truth 
that God is gracious and we don't have to prove ourselves. There's a joyless duty in that older brother as he tells his father, these many years I've been serving you. It was all just to build a resume. It was all just to be something, to prove myself. He's big on performance. He says, I never transgressed your commandment. And there's the proud comparisons that he makes. But this son of yours has devoured your livelihood with harlots. Seems like we tend to think of righteousness like a ladder. And we climb up the rungs and we're further ahead than others and we can look down on them. But grace says there's no ladder. We all stand at the foot of the cross, forgiven of being lawbreakers, God-haters, brother murderers like Cain. None of us were more righteous. We're, we're all just forgiven by the blood of the Lamb. So see God is gracious. And realize you don't have to prove yourself. You're not trying to accomplish or achieve. You're simply acting out what God has made you. You're a saint. So live like it. Heavenly Father, teach us by your word. Let your word resound in our hearts this week. Your prayer, sanctify them with your truth. Your word is truth. Lord, make us people of the words that we will see the truth, believe it, and have lives of righteousness that reflect our faith in it. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.